Thank you, Governor Hogan. Uh, welcome to all of you to this, this, this discussion about fortifying our future, uh, the state's becoming more resilient. Let me start by talking about my own state because I'm getting ready to pitch it anyway. For the August 5 to 7 uh, summer meeting, the NGA in Portland, Maine. But my state has 1.3 million people. It's small. It's the most dispersed population of any state in the country. It sort of juts out of the northeast corner of the country like a thumb hitchhiking towards Europe. Borders Canada, we only, we're the only state that only borders one other state other than Hawaii and Alaska. Um, we're 90% forested. We have clean water and rolling hills and fertile, land, uh, fertile farmlands and mighty rivers and deep ports. And if you take our state and stretch it out as far as you can, the coastline, as jagged and crazy as it is with all the islands, you'll find about 3,500 miles of ocean coastline. So it's remarkable in many areas. But we're seeing the effects of um, disasters, both natural and man-made. Uh, in the small town of Machias, for instance, one of our easternmost towns, we saw extensive flooding in their, in their historic downtown during the 2018 winter storm. Vinyl Haven, the beautiful uh, island right across from the island where Governor Lamont summers, um, a beautiful island off the coast, it lands 10% of Maine's lobster catch. But the offshore island, that island itself, could lose more than 10% of its land to sea level rises, rising by 2100, including much of its working waterfront. We're very concerned about preserving our working waterfronts. With state funding, Vinyl Haven is taking some critical steps to understand their vulner vulnerability and plan for the future. In Portland, where I do, go, do again look forward to greeting you in August, uh, is they're already seeing a threefold increase in average, average annual hours of flooding in the past 20 years versus the past 100 years. That's impacting businesses along the commercial wa working waterfront and the working class bayside neighborhoods. The city is now developing a, a plan, a comprehensive climate action plan. And our state, since I took over 14 months ago, has taken some decisive actions uh, to prepare our infrastructure and our citizens for the incidents that could disrupt the entire state. Mitigation, I think, is the best adaptation uh, strategy. The cost of avoiding the worst of climate change impacts is far lower than the cost of uh, uh, not adapting uh, and living in the worst case scenario. So the, some of the steps we're taking, we want to try to cut emissions. 53% of our greenhouse gas emissions are from transportation sources. We're addressing that. Um, since January 2019, my state has joined uh, the 25 states of the U.S. Climate Alliance, which represents now 55 percent of the United States population. And we've set a goal to achieve statewide carbon neutrality by 2045, because we are seeing rising oceans. The Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99 percent of all ocean bodies. With the legislature's agreement, we established the Maine Climate Council which will recommend a plan, a more comprehensive plan, this December. And they're looking at transportation sources, heating sources, uh, and um, resiliency. We're the, most heat, we're the most fossil fuel dependent state when it comes to heating sources. Uh, we've set in statute a requirement that there would be a 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and an 80% reduction by 2050. We've taken great pains to redo our renewable portfolio standards. Um, we're looking at 80% renewables by 2030, up from 40%, uh, and a goal of 100% renewable power by 2050. We have the most significant renewable standards in the country. And we've established by law an aggressive goal of inst installing 100,000 heat pumps by 2025. Many of us were at the Korean, Korean ambassador's residence last night, and he was describing the architecture of the building and how it was modeled on uh, historical uh, homes in Korea. And I looked up, and above our heads were two large heat pumps. And I thought, well, that's adaptation. <laughs> and uh, in the house, the governor's mansion where I reside during the week, there are 22 heat pumps. Those were put in by my predecessor. So it's a bipartisan effort to reduce our, our dependency on fossil fuels for heat. Um, and we're supporting electrification to facilitate that. We think Maine consumers can save on their heating bills and save costs overall by using heat pumps. Um, 
we have facilitated the launch of the first floating offshore wind demonstration project in the United States with leadership and research from the University of Maine, which has developed the prototype for a floating offshore wind platform that is concrete-based, not steel-based, uh, much, much more adaptable to manufacturing onshore uh, and to movement on, sh uh, on the coast with support from the Federal Department of Energy. We've launched uh, an electric vehicle rebate program and charging infrastructure programs using not taxpayer monies, but the Volkswagen settlement funds. Some of us who were former attorneys general, like Mr. Bashir, Mr. Cooper, myself, um, uh, Mr. Bullock, sued Volkswagen of America over several respects in, in, in tandem with the federal government. Uh, and we're using those monies in the state of Maine to provide rebates for consumers to purchase electric, electric vehicles uh, and to increase our infrastructure across the state of Maine for, infra, for uh, electric vehicle charging stations. So we know that we have to prepare our state and our, our communities for climate change and impacts that can't be avoided. Our governor's office of the future, during my campaign for governor, I often quoted Kurt Vonnegut, who once said, every government, every cabinet ought to have a department of the future. I said, we don't have that in Maine. Now we do. <laughs> it's called an Office of Innovation, Policy, Innovation, and the Future, uh, which I created. And we've hired a senior climate resilience coordinator, fancy term, to lead our communities uh, dealing with issues on climate change and accommodations and resiliency, adaptation to rising sea levels, uh, warming seas, and the like. We're investing in the replacement and upgrading of road infrastructure at steam crossings. I think that could be summarized in one word. Culverts, the more modern culverts. They don't strangle the fish and let them pass easily. Um, and those projects will mitigate flood risks, road washouts, and reduce erosion impacts to streams, brooks, and lakes. And that project itself has brought together unlikely suspects, but environmentalists, sports men and women, uh, contractors, building contractors have all come together behind the culvert projects in our state. They all see an advantage to their interests there. Our Maine Climate Council's Community Resiliency uh, Working Group is exploring ways to prepare our public health system for climate-induced or, intens uh, or intensified health impacts, including tick-borne diseases. We're seeing a lot of ticks come up from the south because of warming climate, warming uh, temperatures. So the deer and moose population have been impacted by that. You can fly over some of the woods in Maine and see moose that have been eaten raw by ticks. And that, of course, can bring Lyme disease as well. Looking at foodborne and waterborne disease outbreaks and even the mental health impacts of disasters and heat waves and floods. We're protecting infrastructure assets that are critical to public safety and to Maine's economy. Providing technical assistance and funding programs to Maine's small and rural towns so they can do their own resilience work, not lay, lie back and think about what it was like 20, 40, 50 years from the, uh, ago, but look to the future. See what changes you can predict. The Governor's Energy Office and Maine Emergency Management are improving and updating our energy assistance or assurance and energy management plan, including discussions around vulnerable infrastructure, utility lines, um, cybersecurity, grid management. Maine's Climate Council's Energy Work Group is identifying strategies to increase resiliency of our assets, our energy assets and grid infrastructure against severe weather and natural hazards. Two years ago, we had a terrific wind, windstorm around Halloween. The, basically, the state went dark and <laughs> lost power for three days. We want to make sure that kind of thing doesn't happen again. So those efforts are a start, uh, but Maine now has an opportunity to develop a more comprehensive and coordinated framework for resiliency. Um, the magnitude of ad adaptation in our small state is, is still daunting. Consider that this narrow slice of infrastructure, 12 to 15 of Maine's 50 plus wastewater treatment plants are highly vulnerable to sea, sea level rise. Don't think too long about that. <laughs> Upgrading just just those assets alone, wastewater treatment plants, will carry a price tag in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And we just heard about the discussion of the federal government's uh, participation in infrastructure plans, or non-participation at this point. Our roads and piers, waterfronts, our grid, our communities will each need investments at that scale or higher. 
Maine is looking to nearby states like Rhode Island and Connecticut and New York, which have inf infrastructure bags, I understand, or green bags to finance large resilience projects. Maine, New York, Massachusetts, New York, and Minnesota have robust technical assistance programs that guide and support and provide funding to communities for resiliency, uh, resilience and sustainability. I think states should also pursue opportunities for collaboration. We all, sh in the Northeast and the New England states, we share the grid. Uh, we should push for policies for, of a national or regional infrastructure bank, that kind of thing that could be that could be one such opportunity for collaboration. So we've come a long ways. Uh, we're digging deep. We, uh, I lifted, one of the first things I did was to lift the moratorium my predecessor had imposed on wind power. We're looking seriously at more land-based wind power, more solar. We lifted the uh, restrictions on net metering so that there were more solar power projects, more than 300 community solar projects waiting permitting right now all across the state of Maine. And again, looking at offshore wind, not just looking at it, developing it with research uh, done by our university. So I'm looking to hear, looking forward to hearing what other states have done to meet similar threats. Uh, given the extent of our waterfront, coastal waterfront, that's the major impact that we have in Maine. Um, so looking forward to hearing from the rest of you. Thank you, Governor Mills. Uh, Doug Bergham from North Dakota, and I'm pleased to be on this resiliency panel with Governor Newsom and Governor Mills. Uh, we, this, uh, I don't know, Governor Hogan, maybe you strategically created this panel by having the uh, farthest northeast coast and the west coast and then the north coast, some people might think, in North Dakota. But uh, for those geographic quiz for everybody, uh, where is the center of North America? Answer, Rugby, North Dakota is the center of North America. So uh, maybe misnamed North Dakota, we should be called Center Dakota. Uh, but in the middle of that, this great continent of ours, uh, we get hit with all kinds of things. And just in the past year, we've got, uh, we've had floods, we've had droughts uh, in the same year. Uh, we've had tornadoes. Uh, I think the only thing we discovered this morning uh, from talking to Governor Ige is we have not had any homes buried in lava. Uh, which he had. So, we're, but in terms of uh, resiliency in our state, uh, which is a, one of the most recently settled places on the planet, uh, of course, we had tribal nations that were there, primarily nomadic for centuries, uh, Scandinavian and German immigration uh, in the 1880s and 1890s, and so we've got a very short history. And sometimes when you build, uh, the built environment meets the natural environment. Uh, there's a collision between those two things, and we think about resiliency, but part of it goes back to uh, us having an understanding of how we design our cities, where we build our cities, uh, and how we build our, our communities. And when we think about that uh, today and the dependency we have on all kinds of hidden infrastructure, include whether it's the power grid, uh, water systems, all those things, as Governor Mills said, it's important to have resiliency there. And I think one thing for all governors to understand is that we're on the front lines of a new battle relative to resiliency in our, in our, in our uh, infrastructure, and that's that I'm sure if you talk to any of your chief information officers, they will tell you that every day, every state, many of our communities are under attack, uh, not from hackers that are sitting in the basement in their pajamas, but we're under attack from foreign national uh, efforts to try to break into uh, the key assets that we have and all the data that we have and certainly the, the power grids and the infrastructure that we have. And, and this is uh, for, for a state like ours uh, that is uh, part of two of the nation's uh, grids, a state like ours that includes uh, some of the nation's most important air bases and missile defense, uh, the fact that we can have uh, foreign nationals trying to hack into a local 200-person school district uh, to get access to information there to, because the parents of those kids work for the National Guard in the state and the National Guard in our state has the full-time mission of protecting those missile bases. Uh, you can see where uh, there's risks uh, in hidden ways that go well beyond uh, the important things that we work on every day like, like flood protection. Uh, Broadband, of course, is uh, critical for us to deliver health care and education in rural areas. Uh, our state at 71,000 square miles is uh, about exactly the same size as all six New England states combined. Uh, and, and so we've got real challenges in covering uh, all of that distance. And, and one of the things that we can do to make smart decisions about how we build infrastructure, even in a small state like ours, we'll have spent over, uh, by the time we're done with the current projects that are planned, over $3 billion on flood protection. Uh, to protect our major cities of Fargo, Grand Forks, Minot, and Bismarck. 
when we're doing that uh, and we're spending billions of dollars, the question you ask yourself is how much information do we have on the data that goes into the hydrology models that tells us how to build flood protection? And the answer is very little. Uh, we we've, we've really are in a thing where there's an imbalance, and when we're talking about spending trillions of dollars at the federal level on infrastructure, I think we've got to carve off, you know, one or two percent, and what, which would mean uh, billions and billions of dollars to spend on, on data collection. And we've really invested this in North Dakota because we're past the era where you can hire a state employee and give them a clipboard and a pickup and have them drive around the state and try to collect data. Uh, human collected data is expensive and efficient. Automatically collected data can be accurate and low cost. Uh, and so with this, uh, you know, push towards uh, innovation over regulation, which is how we think about all of these issues, uh, we're, we're, we're working uh, right now uh, in a whole across every agency to increase the amount of automatically collected data we have to help increase that resilience. Uh, for our folks that work in flood control across the state, uh, we've, we've dis we have deployed a thing we call presence, which is uh, pushing remote uh, systems data uh, for solar powered uh, collection for hydrology information. Now, instead of just collecting them on the major rivers, we can go to streams and other places that might only be flooded seasonally. Don't have to send somebody out there to do a, a check. We're automatically collecting data. We've got a project called Wise Roads where we were doing all kinds of road closures that are important for both industry and human safety. But sometimes we're doing that off a weather report and we might be closing roads across an entire uh, part of the state when if we actually had automatically collected data built into the roads themselves. We could be more precise about which roads were open or safe or the cost of having deploy to, uh, to, to keep those roads open and clean. Uh, all of you, all governors here have got a huge network of pipelines across our nation. There's over 38,000 river crossings for natural gas, oil, and other pipelines in our nation. Uh, when I took office three years ago, I had to ask a question, where are they? Uh, how old are they? What kind of condition are they in? Uh, very hard to get a hold of that data, and I would encourage other governors to ask your teams to think about that. Uh, some of the new ones are probably in great shape. Some of the old ones built 50 years ago probably present some risk, but there is an, there is an opportunity, again, uh, through uh, automatically collected data. And so our state uh, challenged the pipeline industry uh, to step forward. We created a private-public partnership uh, where the state is putting up uh, R&D dollars that match the private sector in a shark tank-like environment where they're competing for ideas. And we've got uh, four ideas that have been funded uh, that can all be potentially transformational. One is a sat satellite-based satellitics uh, that would allow us to do satellite analytics and be able to detect early detection before you actually have a spill uh, you detect. Uh, and again, we're, we're not trying to build like black boxes for the airline industry so we can tell you after we have a spill. We're trying to create solutions that detect ahead of time. Uh, another, another one of those is intelligent paint, where there'd actually be sensors in the paint, so the paint at the uh, intersection of the, the joints, which is where the weak spots are and most of the leaks would occur, could actually detect it ahead of time. Uh, we have a, another one people I'm sure know, oh, pipelines, so, you know, we just run a pig down there, and now they got smart pigs. Many of the older pipelines, too many twists and turns, geologic shifts, diameters might change. You're not able to do that, so there's a company that's uh, created a product called a piper. It's the size of a golf ball. You drop it into the pipeline, it floats down in any fluid, and it can acoustically detect whether or not there's going to be uh, some kind of uh, problem or not. And then finally, uh, when you get humans interacting with data, alarm fatigue can happen. That can happen in healthcare. It certainly happens in, uh, in many kind of, uh, if you're in a been, ever been to a pipeline monitoring station, but uh, you, one company is teaming up with IBM Watson to create an artificial intelligence solution which would use big data artificial intelligence to be able to detect even the slightest changes in pressure that may indicate that there's a problem. So this is all in a matter of a couple years, and I think as people in government, we tend to tend to lean hard on regulation when there's a problem, then we're going to, you know, and we have a natural disaster, then we're going to come up with a bunch of regulations and never happen again. And I think you need to uh, have in your, in your toolkit uh, as leaders to understand that with, you know, Moore's Law driving doubling of, of uh, digital power every 18 months at half the price, that there are solutions that, you know, couldn't even be imagined by the time we get a regulation implemented and an inspector and a pickup driving around. If that takes four to six years to get it through your state legislator and do it, by that time we've turned the crank on Moore's Law three or four more times and you could have solutions like this that are actually uh, really, really help our resilience. And the same thing uh, with cybersecurity. I'm confident that there isn't any 
a state in the nation that's spending too much on cybersecurity, and as any of you have had communities or universities that have been hit uh, with uh, <coughs> with any kind of ransomware or have been shut down like some of our large municipalities have. Uh, the adage is on cybersecurity that you will be happily to spend millions or tens of millions of dollars after the fact uh, when, when your legislature might have been unwilling to spend you know, dimes ahead of time. And so we have uh, got the support of our legislature and we're, uh, we're trying to spend more than dimes but trying to spend that ahead of time to, to build that up because this is uh, one of our biggest resiliency uh, risks. So uh, look forward to questions, but again, thanks for uh, for inviting North Dakota to be on this panel. You had me an intelligent paint, which I uh, <laughs> made a note. Uh, by the way, if I may, just I, I got a brief a little preamble because I'm going to paint a very dystopian picture of California. So can I just briefly, before I do that, make a case for California? Uh, you know, it's a remarkable time because we're enjoying a $21.5 billion operating surplus, record reserves, bond ratings increased uh, twice in the last a year, 119 consecutive months of net job growth. Um, the state's average 3.8% GDP over the last five years. And, and it's not my state of state. But I need to say that because the state of our state um, has been highlighted in the national news and in your consciousness that it's a state on fire. And it's a state that has the largest utility in the United States of America, PG&E, that's in bankruptcy because of the fires. Uh, if any of you still are confused by science and still don't believe in climate change, come to California. Uh, Mother Nature has joined the conversation. The hots are getting hotter, the dries are getting drier, the wets are getting wetter. We just came out of a five-year drought, three of the worst fire seasons in California history during that period of time, the one that generated a lot of uh, national consciousness and attention appropriately was the campfire. Brought President Trump out there. We're grateful for his visit. 18,804 structures were lost just in that one fire. 85 human beings lost their lives. The year before, we had the Tubbs fire that also generated an enormous amount of news attention. 23 lives lost, 7,492 structures lost in that fire. All of you are paying the price for that. All of you generously have helped support our efforts on debris removal, and FEMA support. Uh, many of you around this room, quite literally, I look at four governors that were kind enough to send us uh, a lot of resources in the last uh, fire season, um, which is really now a fire cycle year-round. But in the peak of our season, you were generous enough to send mutual aid from all across the country, from obviously places closer to home, like Oregon and Washington State, but as far away as Montana, uh, where we were seeing assets brought bare. We are sharing assets, you may have seen, uh, in Australia. We lost one of our C-130 uh, training planes uh, that we sent over for the fire suppression efforts in Australia. That Tragically, that plane crashed. Uh, it gives you a sense of the mutuality as it relates to this and what's happening, not just in the United States and western part of the states, but also around the rest of the world. So we're trying to meet this head on. We got a bankrupt utility. We're trying to get out of bankruptcy, um, but they're feeling the pressure of trying to underground and, and harden uh, 150,000 miles uh, of overhead wire. Uh, and they're operating conditions the likes of which they never could have imagined a decade or two ago. We got 1,000 miles of coast. Uh, I grew up in San Francisco. Uh, we mark, uh, a, literally a century ago, eight inches, uh, the sea level rise just in the last century. We expect that to increase exponentially uh, into the new century, losing our beaches, uh, 150 million trees that have died in the state of California because of the drought. Uh, and obviously the impacts in the economy are pretty severe, particularly as an ag state. So we have all the same audacious goals. You know, we're all 100% here, 100% there. We're all competing in that, but we're really now in the how business. And we got to apply those goals, we got to implement our strategies. And one of the areas that I just want to offer, and I try to be brief because I'm sensitive to time, is our fully functioning cap and trade program has provided some $8.6 billion of investments that have allowed us to drive innovation, drive technology solutions, uh, and drive strategies. Our policies have really accelerated uh, investments 
and economic opportunities in this space. California, as a large oil producing state, now has five times as many green tech jobs as we do fossil fuel jobs. We're proof of that paradigm. It's no longer an and, or rather an or. It's clearly uh, an economic imperative for us to move in this direction and transition to low carbon green growth. But the most exciting thing we're doing, at least from my humble perspective this year, is we're getting our pension system, all $700 billion in our two large pension systems, to start aligning investment strategies uh, in our climate resiliency frame. Uh, and that is a very meaningful thing. That's an opportunity to truly move markets. I put a billion dollars in this year's budget up for a climate uh, catalyst fund. Uh, what was interesting about doing that immediately generated interest from the Gates Foundation and others that are looking to potentially partner uh, with the state of California uh, to provide additional resources to really catalyze an innovation construct and mindset in the state. Uh, it's a long way of saying this. Uh, from the ashes that we have quite literally uh, been working our way through, tremendous opportunities present themselves in this space, uh, but the imperative of meeting this moment is profound. Uh, and I just hope we can move past the, you know, uh, this dialectic back and forth and folks can start to wake up to this reality in a more meaningful uh, and systemic way. And as I said, uh, we're going to need all the help and all the partnerships we possibly can get. Uh, and I think this is, in closing, very exciting because just to hear Governor Mills, Governor, you guys talking about the best practices. This is a kind of enlightened competition uh, and I think significant opportunity for all of us, particularly at NGA, to start sharing uh, a collaborative spirit regardless of party uh, to really push through an agenda that we all can be proud of. So I uh, thank you guys for your leadership and Governor Hogan, thanks for uh, having this opportunity to dialogue. Time for questions. Okay, good. Questions from other governors? I mean, we'd like to hear from your states too and how you're interacting with your local governments in particular on emergency disaster efforts and preparation, mitigation. Nobody's doing that. John Bell. Thank you very much, Governor, and uh, thank all three of you. I really appreciate the information and, and you sharing what you're doing in your states. We're no stranger to disaster uh, in Louisiana, you know, and most notably going back uh, to Hurricane Katrina, but since then, multiple floods. We're ground zero for coastal land loss because of subsidence and coastal erosion, but also sea level rise. Uh, but we have a conference uh, in New Orleans where the NGA is actually partnering with RESCON. Uh, and this is one of the premier conferences anywhere in the world about resiliency. It's about preparing for and recovering from disasters, and it will include now cybersecurity. Uh, so I want to put a plug in for this conference with all of the governors. Uh, hopefully you can attend, but at the very least send someone uh, to New Orleans. I think they will get a tremendous amount out of it to the benefit of your state. It happens to be April the 28th through the 30th uh, in New Orleans. And just so you know, uh, the Jazz Fest will be going on at that time. Uh, so you might want to come personally. Uh, but I, I can guarantee you it will be a rewarding experience, uh, one where, where you will learn from academia, uh, international organizations, uh, other states, uh, and business uh, folks from the private sector as well. So I, I would encourage all of you to, to give some thought about coming down to New Orleans April 28th through 30th, or at least sending uh, some folks from your administrations. That's great. Everybody planning to go? I, now I am. <laughs> Well, what about interactions with local governments? How do you help prepare them for uh, these kinds of efforts? Our, our biggest stress is, is land use. We've got 11 million people living in the WUI, this wildland urban interface. And right now, because of these wildfires, folks are having a hard time getting insurance. They're not being renewed. The premiums have gone through the roof. We've got a state plan, the FAIR plan now, where we're seeing huge premium spikes and the ability to absorb uh, all the private sector uh, abandonment there is going to be challenged. Wow. So, it, you know, we're, we're trying, the, the stubbornness on land use is difficult and localism is determinative from a land use perspective, but this is perhaps the most significant thing we can do in terms of being uh, future-proofed in terms of addressing the issue of resiliency broadly, because there's a general sense of retreat now on the coast, on the coastal bluffs and the like, uh, losing again beaches and the erosion, uh, the king tides now happening not every hundred 
100 years, every 10 years, every year, uh, and the challenges uh, associated again with that wildland urban interface in particular make for a vexing uh, relationship at the moment between the state and local government. Are the towns and local uh, communities adapting by, by changing their zoning patterns, their zoning rules, ordinances in either of your states? We haven't seen it yet. I mean, no, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult. Some of the, you know, we, we got a housing crisis in California. Last thing we want to do is tell folks not to build housing, particularly in areas where the land's a lot cheaper than some of the urban environments. But it's, um, you know, you see these master plan communities right in the middle of these zones, and you go, what the hell are these guys thinking? Mm -hmm. um, and again, all, you, you go up to that campfire uh, area. I mean, it's, it's a fire of tornadoes coming through, one, only one part of that community you can get out. Uh, everybody, I mean, I was, you saw all those videos. Uh, and we're seeing that replicated over and over in all parts of our state. And so we're, we may come down a little more aggressively with a hammer from the state level. Uh, but again, uh, local government, as we all know, those come from it. Uh, that's a stubborn issue to address. Uh, I would just say, yeah, we're coming from a state where we believe a lot in local control uh, and self-determination, but even with that, we have to understand that we're in a country where uh, most of the built environment in the last uh, 80 years in this country has been built with uh, that's been automobile-centric and not mm -hmm. people-centric. Uh, and with that, you end up generally with communities that have been built out, not up. Uh, and that creates, uh, you know, the cost of, of uh, local government, school districts, park districts, uh, all their costs go up, rising property taxes, uh, lots of infrastructure to, to maintain. I'm sure the, the numbers we had on the national numbers include all the, you know, all that horizontal growth. But as a state, we're trying to really, through a thing we call the Main Street Initiative, try to drive private capital to existing infrastructure. That's the highest return for taxpayers, if you can get private capital to go back in uh, where you've got existing infrastructure as opposed to the opposite, which would be public capital, which is we had a school district that builds a new school, you know, out in a greenfield site a mile or two out of town because the land is cheap. That's actually very expensive for taxpayers. So mm -hmm. trying to, you know, we've built dashboards for every community so they can see their own data uh, and try to educate the local decision makers so that they can understand the decisions, that design decisions on on where and how you build uh, really make a difference on what then we have to rebuild after we've had a disaster. But the, you know, the good thing about North Dakota is that virtually everybody in the state has is so close to our agricultural roots where it doesn't matter what year it is, you're dealing with things you can't control with Mother Nature, uh, good years and bad years. And so we've got a lot of people who've got uh, you know perseverance and fortitude and willing to work through that. So we've got a good spirit of cooperation. But it, uh, some of these decisions are, are we're going to have to think differently about the future than we have in the past and I'd say again on that you know technology is changing uh, every job every company in every industry and it's certainly you know blowing up segments like retail and a lot of communities you know built outwards because they're trying to accommodate drive-through restaurants and big box retailers and that those models are all under threat uh, yeah. because of the uh, of internet retail selling and so again there's an opportunity on those former big box sites for all kinds of infill opportunities to come back and build really tax efficient walkable communities which helps increase health, increase a sense of community, increases a lot of things that we also spend money on the back yeah. end because we're a nation that walks less than any other nation. Yeah. Wow, even in North Dakota. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other questions from other governors? Yes, Mr. Governor Herbert. Thank you, Governor Mills. Um, Governor Edwards just reminded me of a lesson I learned from Louisiana. Uh, I was uh, visited there about 15 years ago and saw the devastation from Hurricane uh, Katrina and Rita. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Mitch Landrieu, now I think he well, he's he maybe not the, the mayor of New Orleans now, but he, he became the mayor of New Orleans. And he took me around and showed me what had taken place there and kind of the, the successes and the failures of government. Hmm. And some of it was the people weren't prepared. And so out of that, uh, incident, and what we learned in Utah was to put together a program where we enhanced the first responders, local government, which would be the cities and then the counties, and then the state. The federal government's a little slower to react. They can help pay bills and come and mm. do the aftermath, but they're not going to be the first responders. And we also put together a program that helps us prepare families, individuals, 72-hour uh, kits, you know, it's always been asked, you know, we call it Be Ready Utah. Be ready for what? Well, fill in the blank. 
We can have fire, floods, earthquake, drought. Uh, we've had all of the above. Uh, but individuals and families need to take on the responsibility of themselves. Uh, we work with our schools, so they have a 12-step a, a program, what they need to be doing in the schools, along with a 12-step program for families and individuals. They can go to our webpage and get instructions and, uh, and find out how to take care of how do you turn off the natural gas in your home? Uh, yeah. How do you secure your uh, medicines? Your, what do you do about your pets? What about elderly people, or maybe or your family or your neighbors? And then we worked, took a third step, and that was the private sector businesses. If you have that kind of acute problem, the next thing you have looting. Somebody's going to the local Walmart and stay, taking uh, you know, uh, some kind of uh, uh, issue, whether it be a generator or uh, something to help with your water purification, things you should have had on hand. And so we have now a consolidated four-step program, private sector, school, business, and government, all working in concert under the heading of Be Ready Utah. It's going to help us. It has helped us already when we've had some fires wow. to have uh, the first responders taken care of, neighbors act, uh, government comes in and takes care of the, the mop up, the cleanup. But it's a concerted combined effort, mm -hmm. not just looking for the federal government to come in and bail us out. So anyway, it's working for Utah. And again, I thank uh, Louisiana for sharing us that information, which created a great program in Utah. Thank you, Governor Herbert. It's like, you know, everybody says it can't happen here until it does happen here. And it can happen in any one of our states. Uh, these disasters, whether cold, hot, wet, dry, uh, and we've got to be ready. I think we've all sat back for years and years and thought, well, if something bad happens, FEMA will come in, the federal government will help us out. We've got to start this at home and, as you said, build, building families' resiliency uh, businesses locally is important, bottom up. Thank you very much. I think that ends this panel discussion. Uh, if, I'm going to take the liberty of moving into a brief uh, presentation about the great state of Maine. <laughs> Floods, blizzards, and rains, and, and r rising waters notwithstanding. <clears throat> We're inviting you all to visit our <laughs> great state uh, in the city of Portland on August 5th to 7th. Uh, we have a booth outside where you can pick up some chocolate-covered blueberries, best blueberries in the, in the world, wild blueberries. We're also going to offer a lobster bake on an island in Casco Bay. We're working on some really dynamic speakers for this summer conference. Uh, Portland, Maine, not to be confused with Portland, Oregon. Portland, Maine has been cited by Bon Appetit and others as the foodie capital of the country now. There will be exciting uh, delicacies and restaurants to uh, enjoy. Maine has become home to more than 150 craft breweries, if you like craft brews. All of that will be at your fingertips um, when you come to Portland, August 5th to 6th, 7th. Um, and we, I want to extend a personal invitation to every one of you. Hope you can make it. It's going to be informative and fun. And I think that there's a film to be shown yeah. somewhere. Hello, I'm Maine Governor Janet Mills. I have been, to put it mildly, gently encouraging the National Governors Association to hold their next summer meeting in Portland for a little while now. And guess what? It's happening. I'm excited and thrilled to be able to host you all as guests in my great state this coming August. So now that it's happening, let me offer a little trip planning advice. One, make sure you book your travel to Portland, Maine and not that other Portland or any of the other Portlands across the country. I'm sorry, Governor Brown, but after all, Portland, Maine was founded first. Two, when you come for the meeting, be sure to schedule in some sightseeing time for yourself and your families. Whether it's our western mountains, our lakes and streams, great for fishing, our rolling fields and forests, or our 3,500 miles of iconic rocky coastline and gorgeous islands, there's something for everyone, and the weather's gonna be great. Plus, from the Old Port to the Arts District, with museums and shows to historic parks and forts along Casco Bay and the Atlantic Ocean, Portland, Maine has a lot to offer you this summer. Finally, I shouldn't say finally, it gets people's hopes up, but finally, enjoy our wonderful food. Maine has so much superb cuisine to offer you. Governor Hogan, I know you love your Maryland crabs, but we've got lobster. It's worth a try. Plus, 
Portland, Maine was named the best restaurant city of the year, and I hope you will all find out why. I am thrilled to welcome you all to Maine next summer. You know, re-engaging with the NGA and getting to know all of you, hearing your challenges and your successes, proposing new solutions with you has been of tremendous benefit to me as governor, and I look forward to building on those relationships. Thank you, and I hope to see you all in August for the NGA Summer Meeting 2020. I've never had, I never had the opportunity to introduce myself before. That was a little bizarre. Well, Governor Mills, thank you very much for leading the panel, and thank you so much for hosting us in Maine. I think it's going to be a terrific visit. And uh, while uh, uh, you know we can have an argument about Maryland crabs and, and, and Maine lobster, I'll, I'll just settle for eating both of them. How about that? Uh, but thank you very much.